<laughs> Marriage Prep 101, getting ready for the big day. We're in the sixth lesson of this series, titled, Now That We Are Together. So far, we've, uh, we've talked about issues that single people deal with before uh, they get married. For example, uh, knowing when we're mature enough to contemplate marriage. Talked about guidelines in seeking a, a mate, what Corey was just mentioning in his uh, prayer. Uh, we've looked at the uh, profile, the ideal husband, the ideal wife, and you know, we're shooting at ideals here. We're, 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 we're looking at what the ideal should be. Obviously, we're, we, all of us fall short in one way or another, don't want us to be discouraged, but I mean, you know, at least in the class, theoretically, you know, we're trying to establish, okay, well, what would be an ideal partner that I, would, uh, that I would seek if I was seeking a partner? And we've also reviewed some myths about marriage itself and how to create a better one. Of course, everybody wants a happy marriage. Nobody goes into marriage saying to themselves, oh boy, I can't wait till the fighting starts. <laughs> you know, nobody's thinking that. Uh, even people who are you know, getting married for the second time, you know, I've done weddings for people who have been widowed you know, and then they're remarrying or people who've had to divorce, they're getting remarried for a second time, even a third time. And I've never met an individual who wasn't hoping to succeed at the marriage that they were, you know, that they were getting into. Uh, everybody wants to succeed uh, at marriage. Um, a happy marriage, however, often depends on how well we manage the changes that take place after we say, I do. After the wedding day, there's often an emotional letdown as the newlyweds think, okay, what happens now? A lot of newlyweds, they're so focused on the big day, of course, you know, the plans, the wedding, the reception, the, the honeymoon trip, a new house, there's so many, everything's new, you're excited, you're caught up in all of that. And then all of a sudden, at some point, you've moved in, you've got your jobs, uh, you know, the, the, the thank you notes have all been sent you know, for the wedding gifts, you know, and, and you kind of settle into, okay, we're married, now what? And sometimes there's a, there's a little letdown at this point. You know, should I feel different? Where do I go emotionally from here? I've been on this high for you know, a little while, planning this wedding, getting all excited, anticipating. Where to now? You know, I tell engaged couples that the ceremony is not the substance of the marriage. It's the symbol of what is taking place. The people, the ceremony, the dress, the reception, the excitement of setting up a house for two are all tangible signs that a significant change is taking place in their lives. When you get married, what happens is that there is an irreversible life change that takes place on many levels. Uh, you could almost say that the change uh, is a, what's called a metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is a Greek word uh, that means a drastic change or a transformation. Uh, the example from nature, for example, um, in God's creation, um, where we see metamorphosis, you know, the caterpillar becomes a butterfly. That's the true definition of metamorphosis. That's not just like a, a bunny rabbit that kind of changes colors you know, with, with, with the seasons. Uh, th that is a change of some sorts, but that's not a metamorphosis. A metamorphosis is this little caterpillar becomes some, a butterfly that can fly. That's a metamorphosis. And that's what takes place actually when we get married, not just a change but an actual metamorphosis takes place in our lives when we get married. Most are familiar with the changes, but as a way to establish a baseline for further discussion, let's review some of the changes that take place on the day you say, I do. Things that take place. Number one, a new legal status begins. In marriage, we enter into a legal and binding contract with precise conditions to live with one another as husband and wife. 
This contract is recognized by certain societies uh, and it carries special privileges for the couple. You have certain property and succession rights that you don't have if you're a single person. Uh, you have family, you have laws that protect the family that you have formed. There are income tax uh, advantages. Uh, you also have social recognition as legally married people. This contract is required and also uh, required and recognized by God, not just society. Uh, in Romans 13, six and seven, Paul is talking about the, you know, that God gives to the government the right to exercise, to make and exercise laws. So laws of government are ordained by God, including those on marriage and family. So not to be married by the law of the state, whatever state that is, is not to be married before God. If you didn't legally get married you know, uh, in front of the justice of the peace or the witch doctor in your village, whichever society you're in, if you didn't follow the society's rule about what it is to be married, then you're not married in front of God either. Okay. So if we're married before the state and the law, whatever that law is, well then we're married before God. And so the first change that takes place when we marry is legal in nature. On the wedding day, we have a new legal status as a married couple. Those of you who are married, you remember on the day you got married, at some point uh, you had to go into the office or somewhere and you had to sign the, the papers, you had to sign the marriage license. Usually that's a photo op, isn't it? The, 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 the photographer wants to take a picture of both of you signing the paper. And that paper has to be then witnessed and signed by a, an agent of the government. That can be a justice of the peace or a lawyer, it can be a minister, a rabbi, whatever. Uh, but uh, that person represents the state. Okay, so that's one of the changes that takes place on the day you say, I do. A new legal status occurs. Another thing that changes, a new relationship begins. Jesus, in quoting the Old Testament, said in Matthew 19, verse five, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So on our wedding day, when we exchange the vows of marriage, it's the beginning of our exclusive permanent relationship with our partner. And this is what sets marriage apart from every other relationship. What's so, I've heard people say, what's so special about marriage? Well, I'll tell you what's so special about marriage. Exclusivity, that's what's special about marriage. You're, you're never going to be one flesh with anybody else. No other contract you ever sign will demand of you that you be one flesh with that person. You only sign that contract one time with that person to be one flesh. It's exclusive and it's permanent for life. You, know, you marry for life. And I understand things happen but we're talking about the ideal here. The ideal is when we marry, we marry for life, okay? This exclusivity and this permanence uh, legalized in a contract is not required of you for any other relationship in your whole life. Only the marriage relationship requires exclusivity and permanence. That's what makes it uh, special. So whatever relationship existed before, whatever happened before is annulled by what is happening now. You had a boyfriend before? You had a boyfriend for six years and you broke up with your boyfriend and then you know, a year later you met so-and-so and, and, and a year after that you married so-and-so and you only married you know, the person you married, you only knew that person for two years but you married that person? Well, yeah, well that contract that you have with that person that you only knew for two years, 
that erases that other six year relationship. That thing's gone, dead, buried, it's over. That's what's so special about marriage. It cancels out everything that has happened in the past. That doesn't mean you don't have some sort of connection there, but it cancels it out as a priority. So if you are a single or if you are an unmarried person, when I, when I use the term unmarried, the biblical term unmarried uh, refers to uh, people who are, have been widowed or people who have been divorced, they are unmarried, okay? So if you're a single person, meaning you've never been married, or an unmarried person, meaning you're not married at the moment, and you willingly enter into a marriage, then this new relationship takes precedence over all other human connections, okay? So at the wedding, two people forge a permanent and exclusive relationship with each other, something they will not have to do with anyone else until death. So that's something else that happens. That's something that changes. On the day you say, I do, then you enter into this type of relationship. Another thing that changes on the day you say, I do. A new identity begins. Jesus said, for this reason, a man will cleave to his wife, Matthew 19, 5. So before we marry, we are known or we are referred to as, hey, that's uh, you know, Paul, the son of uh, uh, Michael and Lise, or, or, or you, oh, she's the daughter of so-and-so, or she's so-and-so's sister, or related to such and such, how we kind of identify people. But after our vows of marriage, our identity is no longer linked with our parents or ourselves, but rather with our partner. This is not a popular idea today in a society where self-expression and self-development and self-fulfillment is the rage and pursuit of personal independence within the couple are promoted vigorously. We need to realize that these concepts work against what marriage was initially created to achieve. You, you, you cannot form a one flesh relationship with a person if you are at the same time pursuing self-fulfillment and, you know, and independence. Those two things, they don't work together. A life experience where two individuals are brought together to form one complete identity, that's what marriage was designed to do. A life of interaction, a life of integration, a life of interdependence. That's, that's what marriage is. Now you might disagree with that, you might not like that, and you know, some guru on TV might say that's old fashioned, they, they can talk all they want. That's what the Bible teaches that marriage is about. So when I marry, I can no longer think in terms of just me, when I think of my hopes, my dreams, my needs. The change of identity that takes place at marriage requires me to acknowledge the new me. And the new me includes my partner. That's the new me, that's, that's who I now am. Me, all by myself, is no longer there. Me now includes another person. There's an identity change that takes place. The change in identity also means that other people think of me in new terms as well. When you think of me now, you're really thinking of Lee's and I, because that's me. And when you think about Lee's, you're thinking about Lee's and Mike, because that's the new Lee's. So many marriages suffer because the partners refuse to take on their new identities as married people, or others refuse to accept that the old person has changed. There are a lot, of less, there are a lot less problems with in-laws and old boyfriends and girlfriends and buddies when this happens. You cannot consider the person as just an individual anymore. You have to 
consider the person as part of a couple. Because a new identity begins to form on the day that we marry. It's part of the excitement. It's part of the newness. It's, it's part of the thing that, 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 that we're wanting to experience. Something else that changes on the day I say I do. A new role begins. When, when we take our vows, there's also a change in role that we will play in life that begins. We're no longer simply brother or friend or daughter, but we take on the role of husband and or wife. Now in every society, human beings have tried to manipulate the roles in marriage in order to gain advantage. For example, polygamy. Polygamy, you know, a man has several wives. The man rules and has several wives. Or marriages where they say, well, we're equal partners. We run our marriage like a business. Each of us gets one vote. <laughs> I love that when I hear that. Yeah, in our marriage, each one of us gets one vote. Really, I said, you know what the next question is, right? What happens in the event of a tie? How do you break the tie? You know, even in business, you don't have one and one. Even in a business, you don't. You know, people say, we run it like a business. What business have you ever seen where there's equal votes? Somebody's got to have the you know, responsibility to break the tie. Or postmodern marriages. You know, the use of genetic engineering to replace the need for a partner to have a family. Pfft, men, who needs men? I don't need a man, I just go down to the clinic, you know, have myself injected, go to the sperm bank. I want a baby with blue eyes and uh, you know, blonde hair or something. Yeah, postmodern marriage, who, need, who needs a partner? Let science fill, it, fill that in. I, I, I don't love it, but when I hear you know, this, this, women say that sometimes in movies, you, know, you don't need men anymore, really. Ask yourself why little boys grow up and start shooting people randomly for no reason. Interesting study that came out, just came out on the heels of the shootings that we've had. 97% of these shooters, 97% of these shooters, no father, no father. Raised by single moms, raised in orphanages, raised in families where dad was a drunk, where dad was not there, where dad was just you know, a sheep. 97%, tell yourself, yeah, we don't need men, we don't need fathers. And of course, it's just as ridiculous going the other way. We don't need mothers, who needs mothers? You know, God designed marriage to have two partners and children need two people to learn how to be whole, how to be complete. You have to have two people. Now, it's not always possible. I understand that, you know, I understand that idea. So these systems, you know, postmodern equal partnerships have a variable success rate, but none of these are accurate according to God's plan for precise roles within marriage. The Bible clearly uh, explains what roles, what these roles are to be fulfilled by both man and woman in marriage. And these instructions have been so misrepresented at times and, and misinterpreted uh, over the century. Uh, let's read a passage, the one that people go to to criticize all the time. Uh, Ephesians chapter five, shall we? Verse 22. This is Paul writing, giving instructions. He says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, 
Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water uh, with uh, the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. So men, unfortunately, have used parts of this passage to justify the brutal repression of women. They've used parts of this passage here to say, I'm the boss, we're going to do what I say because I'm the boss, it's, the, it's in the Bible. Go ahead, go ahead. They don't read the whole passage, they just read you know, the husband's the head of the wife, they say, right there, there it is. You know. So you got to do what I say because I'm the boss. And of course, women have used it to justify their argument that Paul was a misogynist, a woman hater, and the Bible is not relevant for today's woman. That's how they've used this passage. But look at what the passage actually says. It says that men are to treat their wives as Christ treated the church. Give that a little bit of thought there for a moment. What did Christ do for the church? Well, he cared for the church, he served the church, he fed the church, he protected the church, he encouraged the church, he even washed the apostles' feet. When was the last time you washed your wife's feet? And he died to save the church even after the church abandoned him in the garden. He was faithful until death, no matter, no matter what happened. Uh, that's the, the bar that is set for how men are to treat their wives. They're to, if they have to, give their lives to save, to protect their wives. You know that men are the protectors is not an archaic idea. Even in 2019, men still need to have the role that God has given them to protect their wives, to protect their homes. And when this idea is ridiculed, it lessens man's value of himself. Now, men are not always asked to give up their lives in a single moment. You know, you're always thinking, an intruder comes into the house in the middle of the night and with a gun, you know, and is about to harm the wife or the children and the man is ready to stand, you know, take a bullet. I'm ready to take a bullet for my wife or my kid. In an instant, I'll die, you know, to protect my, my, my wife to protect my children. And they, in their mind, they said, well, you know, I'd be ready to do that. I wouldn't let someone to my house to harm my children. I'd, they'd kill me first. But this idea of giving up your life also for your wife, yeah, it's also giving up your life in dribs and drabs <laughs> over a 55 year period. You know, doing some of the dirty work. You know, being the first to you know, do something that's difficult, giving up something so that they can have some, some comfort or some peace. In other words, giving up your life, instead, let's say your life was worth you know, a, a million dollars, instead of just giving the one million dollars in one shot, most of us men, husbands, we give up our lives for our wives a dollar at a time a dollar at a time, in a million little ways, we give up our lives to protect, to support, to sustain, to feed, to uplift, to encourage you know, our wives. Most of us, that, that's how we give up our lives, a dollar at a time, day by day, by day, by day, by day. And then he says to the wives, Women should treat their husbands as the church responds to Christ. So 
How did the church respond to Christ? With love, with respect, with service, eager to please, to obey. We know many of the early church uh, suffered and died in order to remain faithful to their, to their Lord. Marriage, Paul says, is the attempt to create here on earth between a man and a woman the mystical union that exists between Christ and the church. Marriage is a preview of heaven. I know some people say, really? Oh dear, then I don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about how women should respond to their husbands. If a husband is spending his life, you know, my example, a dollar at a time, day by day, what woman does not want to submit herself to a man who is pouring out his life in order to express his love and devotion to her? Why wouldn't you want to submit to a man who's doing that? Why wouldn't you want to love and respect and follow in the, in the sense of following his spiritual leadership, his moral leadership? Why wouldn't you want to follow a man who is demonstrating the giving of his life for you? So we can invent new roles and attitudes and stay married with these revised roles, but we will not be creating the heavenly model that we're called upon to do in a biblical marriage. A lot of the things we do as Christians here that God has given us, uh, He's given us in order to give us a preview of what it's like in heaven. You know, we live in a world that, has, you know, that is absolutely saturated with sexuality. I mean, they use sexuality for just everything in our society today. And yet the Bible calls on us to be sexually pure in mind and in body in, and intent. And sometimes you think, well, God, I'm telling you, he's trying to just take away, you know, whatever fun we have, he's just trying to take it away from us. You know? When we don't understand that sexual purity enables us to have a better view of who God is. The more sexually pure we are, the clearer our vision becomes of who God is. So of course Satan is going to tempt us sexually because he doesn't want us to have a clear vision of who God is. I use that example simply to make the point that everything God gives us to do or to attempt is always, always to try to help us to see heaven, to see the other world, to see beyond the physical into the spiritual. And so the roles in marriage that we accept, that we practice, that we live out, they're given to us so that we get an idea of what the relationship with, with God is going to be like when we're not hindered by this sinful body. And so as I said, the thing we have to realize about these biblical roles for husbands and wives within marriage is that they go against our basic human natures. I mean, husbands are not naturally disposed to sacrificing themselves and making their wives their number one priority. That's not, an, <laughs> that's not what guys feel naturally. What guys feel naturally is, I want what I want. <laughs> and I want it right now. <laughs> and I want it again. That, that's, that's pretty much how guys, how guys feel. And wives, wives are not naturally disposed to obeying their husbands in all things. Are you kidding me? Submissiveness does not come naturally, not in our society. So these new God-given roles that we receive in marriage must be learned and achieved through patience and the grace that God gives us through Christ. All right, some of the things that change on the day we say I do, 
a new legal status, a new relationship, identity, a new role, and a new family begins. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 24, the joining of two parties in marriage creates a new family unit. This doesn't mean that there is no love or bonding that remains with parents, but now there's a new priority. Many marriages fail because one or both partners refuse to let mom and dad go and put husband or wife first. Now there'll always be pressure by families, especially around holidays, of course, to demonstrate loyalty. But remember that when you marry, you are creating a new family unit to which you are pledging your first loyalty to for the rest of your life. You know, it's everybody wondering, you know, why do parents, why are they crying at the wedding? Well, they're crying at the wedding because they realize there goes my baby. There goes my little girl. She's going to have her first loyalty now to her husband, not to her dad. For so many years, her dad was the greatest. Her dad was the best. She'd go to her dad first. She had a problem. She needed some cash. She needed some advice, blah, 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 blah. And dad has got tears going down his eyes as he walks down the aisle with her and then he hands her over to her to be husband in just a few moments. And he has a moment of you know, happiness and sadness because he realizes, there goes my baby. I'm not number one anymore. I'm still loved, but I'm not going to be number one anymore. So once we become Mr. and Mrs., we need to understand and expect the changes that happen because we have become married. There's a legal change, a new legal status within society needs to be recognized. A new relationship, a new exclusive permanent relationship has begun. There's an identity change. We are no longer one, we're two in one. We make decisions no longer based on how we think and what we want and what's good for us. We have to now make decisions based on what's good for the two of us. What will serve the two of us? A role change. We now begin to play the role of husband or wife and then eventually father and mother. And there's a family change. We create a new family and a new priority. And this family change sometimes is the toughest thing. Listen, when, when, when Susie continually calls her dad to get advice, calls her dad to you know, find out what's uh, going on, or maybe calls her mom you know, to, to figure things out for everything before she even talks to her husband, it won't take long before there's a problem. It won't be long before there's a problem. Of course your mom and your dad have more experience than your partner. Of course, they, they've been parents for 20, 25, 30 years. Of course they have experience. But each partner has to work at the idea, uh, to create the idea in the other one's mind that, listen, I know that my dad may have you know, a lot more experience than you as a dad and so on and so forth. But when something comes up, you're going to be the first one to know. When there's a problem, I'm going to bring it to you first. And we're going to try to figure this thing out together. And if we need to reach out to get some help, we'll do it. How? We'll do it together. The two of us will call your dad or my mom or my uncle or you know, I know a guy or whatever. But we'll do it together. You will always be first. You will always be the first person to know the good news or the bad news. You will always be the first person to know my success or if I have failed. You'll always be the first one. I mean, if I could just tattoo that on somebody's arm, you know, when they get married, you're getting married, you say, I do. All right, we go over here to the tattoo parlor and we're going to have this tattooed on your arm so you don't forget it. 
Marriage according to God's plan is satisfying and challenging and it's also life changing. Okay, so we've covered a lot of the material this time out. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, next week we're going to cover, we're going to start the four A's of a successful marriage. So we're moving out of the, before I got married, you know, this is what I need to be looking for and thinking. And uh, on the day I get married, these are the things that change. And now the lessons that we're going to go to finish up the series are going to be about, okay, we're married. How do we deal with this stuff? Okay, so we're going to talk about married stuff as we go forward. All right, thank you for your attention. Is that the bell? How about that?